All right, welcome back everyone to the REST API in-depth course. In this video, we're going to go over DNS, IP addresses, and ports. Um, when I was putting this series together, I was really thinking hard to myself. I was like, should I put these topics in? Because next up after this one is like protocols. And it all sounds kind of intense and very scary. And really, we kind of just want to build REST APIs. But when I looked back at my experiences building uh, these kinds of tools, uh, I realized that it's really important to have these fundamentals because we kind of make a lot of assumptions when we're actually building these things like different REST APIs and just working with other APIs, third party APIs in general. Um, there's a lot of assumptions that kind of go in there. And, and I'm not really a fan of assuming too much. Um, what you'll no normally notice is that if you uh, go back and you try to question your assumptions, normally you end up uh, actually not knowing as much as you initially thought you did. And uh, it's good to actually stick with the basics and the fundamentals. So um, there's nothing pretty much more fundamental with uh, a lot of networking than things like DNS, IP addresses, and ports. Hence the topic of this video. And the next video is going to be about protocols where we can go a little bit deeper before we really start working with the actual REST API content itself. So uh, without further ado, let's actually get right to the content. OK, so to start, um, kind of case in point. What I'd like you to think of, and again, we'll get to these acronyms um, of uh, DNS IP addresses and, and ports together in, in a sec, because that's the point of this video. But I'd like you to think for a second, just imagine that you're sitting there. And let's say, for example, that you have an interview. All right. And it, maybe it's for some kind of development or, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be web development, but just just pretend it's, it's just some kind of software interview. I want you to imagine if the question uh, the interview poses to you is what happens when you make a request to a website like, say, Google.com? Right? Maybe they put uh, something in there like HTTPS uh, colon slash slash www.google.com. Like what actually happens? Can you like explain it to me in detail uh, as best as you can? Right. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's funny because I've actually asked this question before in many interviews and usually there's like a progression, uh, <laughs> like a, a progression of uh, emotion that kind of goes like from this. Uh, which is like, oh, that's an interesting question. I, I didn't expect to be asked that question. I like it. I'm going to think about it. Then it goes to kind of this this emotion, not really sure what this is, or some form of this, which is uh, kind of just like, oh, dear. Uh, I don't actually know <laughs> what happens. Uh, how am I going to you know make stuff up and, and not seem uh, kind of silly in front of this interviewer? Um, and then you kind of just eventually land up with your mind being blown because you realize that um, you know a lot of these things are uh, you know, you just you just don't know them and uh, you have to sit and you actually have to learn them. And it's uh, pretty central to how a lot of tools that we use every day work. Um, if you think about it, how many times have you oops, uh, how many times have you like just went in and typed something like this in your browser, for example, right? Like we, we type in this kind of stuff almost every day. Maybe not there's like autocomplete and stuff like that, but we see this kind of stuff almost daily, right? Especially if you're using a web browser a lot. Um, but it, sometimes you don't really step back and think like, okay, like what actually is, what is this? Like, how does it actually work? So that's the point of, uh, at least part of the point of this video. And the next video is going to go into a bit more depth on things like protocols. So let's start with this high level idea of what a URL is. Okay. Um, so a URL is a uniform resource locator. That's what, that's what the acronym stands for. And as I always like to say, I don't, not really a fan memorizing kind of uh, definitions and acronyms like this. Um, but in this case, it's actually not too bad. Like this one's actually, uh, it kind of makes sense. Um, unlike a lot of acronyms, uh, for the most part, uh, it's, it's a uniform, it's a resource locator. I, I want to always come back to this idea of it's, it's locating some kind of resource that that's actually so central to literally everything we're going to be doing with REST APIs, that uh, that's why we're starting with this as a fundamental building block. It is a way to find something, some kind of resource. And we use resource as a very generic term, uh, very similar to you, you, you use something like a thing. We want to find some thing, okay? So when you see a URL, you're probably thinking of something like this. So let's break this down a little bit so we can kind of uh, piecemeal approach it and uh, and see kind of different tools uh, that each part of these represent. So in the front here, we have um, HTTP or HTTPS, uh, that is something called a protocol or a scheme. So that's going to actually be its own video, uh, which is going to be the next video after this. We're going to go into protocols um, in depth uh, so we can actually see things. Um, 
like what is HTTP, what is HTTPS, uh, what is TLS, what are what are all these different types of protocols, what do they mean and why uh, are they important for us to know as developers of things like APIs. Uh, but we'll get to that in the next video. Uh, but it's important to know that that is there. Then there's this thing called a subdomain, which is this www. And this is pretty standard. A lot of times you see www, you probably have omitted it a lot of times, so you don't have it in the URL. You, it, it just kind of gets put there automatically for you sometimes, or uh, it, it's just not there at all. Um, you might have seen other subdomains, for example, like maybe there's like a file subdomain or, or like a message board subdomain or something like that. Uh, you might have seen those before. I'd like you to think of maybe some examples that you've seen personally um, in your experience using the web. The part that most of us are probably most familiar with is the actual main domain, which is the, the kind of uh, the brand or, or the, the main concept of the thing that we're uh, looking for. So for example, uh, maybe we're, we're in this case going to Google. So Google is kind of like the central idea for this URL. Uh, if we were going to uh, go to YouTube, for example, that's like the central domain and all the things around it are kind of revolving around the fact that it is YouTube. Um, so that's kind of the central part of the, the URL. Then there's this thing called a top level domain. You might've seen these uh, often. There are things like uh, com, which is usually for uh, like uh, United States or American companies. There's uh, like, for example, in Canada, we have .ca. Um, there's all these fancy ones like .ai and .io. Uh, a lot of them are for, most of them are for countries. Some of them are kind of just fancy ones that are kind of made up that are relatively new, like .dev, uh, for example, that Google recently introduced. Um, but there's a, there's a limited subset of what these TLDs um, are. Um, and it's kind of interesting to take a look at what they might be if you just search uh, on Google for some examples. We've probably seen many, for example, .org or uh, .mil and things like that. Then there's this thing uh, after the slash, which is usually called the path. And this can be quite long. So in this case, it's just one thing, which is slash search. But I'm sure you've seen URLs where it's like, you know, like slash uh, search, slash profile, slash user, slash something, 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 right? Um, and that whole thing would be the path. Um, and at the very end of the path, sometimes, optionally, we can have other things. In this case, I've shown that we have something called query parameters or search uh, search parameters, uh, but we can have other things in there like uh, anchors and things like that. Now, I've omitted something uh, omitted something in here called the port, uh, which comes after the the, the TLD here. Uh, in this case, we're assuming a port number because this HTTPS probably four four three. But we will uh, get to that shortly, just so that it makes more sense. Uh, but just know that there are a few other things that you will see in a URL normally um, that are uh, that that really depend on what you're trying to locate. But at its core, as long as you can kind of look at this and it kind of makes sense, some of these terminologies, uh, it will really, really help a lot once we're building our own APIs because eventually we're gonna have our API on the internet and we're gonna need to pick a domain. So we might go to like a web hosting provider uh, and, and we would pick a name and then we would register that name and we'd have a top level domain. We would we could have our own subdomains as many as we need. Uh, we would have to figure out what protocol to use and kind of all the different paths that we're gonna be building in our APIs together. Okay, cool. So let's take a look now at uh, these ideas uh, that kind of are built on top of this so that we can kind of build back up to this uh, pretty quickly together. To start, I want to share with you this idea of a DNS or domain name system. Um, you may have seen this before. Uh, it's, it might sound scary, uh, but I, I promise you that it's important to learn and it's actually not that scary. So computers, it turns out, uh, do not understand domain names. So that thing that we just looked at before in the URL, like www.google.com, for example, right? Uh, the computer has no idea what that is. Just no clue. Right, uh, because computers fundamentally, uh, at the end of the day, really only understand numbers. Uh, they're they're kind of zeros and ones, uh, binary uh, systems for the most part, and everything kind of get rep uh, gets represented as a number. Um, so what actually happens um, is behind the scenes, there's this entire system called the domain name system, which takes these names, these domain names, as the name uh, of domain name system implies and actually gives us back uh, what's called uh, an IP address, which we're gonna look at together next. Um, so the way that this normally works is uh, in a network like the internet uh, is we'll have some client, like for example, my computer or your phone or you know a, a fridge or a smartwatch or whatever, and that is going to ask for some URL uh, or some domain in this case. So for example, google.com. So we're gonna be asking a question of this domain name system. That computer is already set up usually with a set of uh, DNS servers that it can talk to to figure out uh, what the answer is uh, once it reaches out. So it, it already has behind the scenes a bunch of 
these IP addresses uh, to figure out where to, to talk to for that DNS server. Um, so assuming that, we can reach out to them and we can say, hey, where's google.com? Can you please let me know? And the DNS server's job is to reply to us with an IP address. That usually looks something like this. This is something called an IPv4 address, which we'll get into in the next slide. But this is something a computer does understand. And it can take this IP address and it can route our data uh, to that server through something like the internet, for example. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to this kind of system uh, that uh, I, I won't. I don't want to get too deep into. Uh, I'd like you to think for yourself. What are some examples of having this extra layer uh, of abstraction where we're not mapping directly to IP addresses, but we actually are mapping to domain names, and then it's a domain name server's job to tell us the IP addresses, right? Why not just directly try to memorize these things? Apart from the fact that it's very complicated to actually try to remember that this is Google.com, for example, as a human being. So. So think about that, and I'd love to hear in the comments kind of what are some things and strategies you come up with as to why this is actually a great system um, for an abstraction layer. Okay, um, and, and I just want to note here uh, that in, in practice, this is like a multi kind of step system. So there's like all these sorts of name servers and there's like a root server and, and they're all very secure and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, I, I, th at its core, it doesn't really matter. For, for, for our purposes, it, it's just like there are these servers called DNS, and we can ask them a question and we can say, hey, where is, you know, YouTube.com? And it's going to give us an IP address and we're going to get back that answer. All right. So I want to show you this really quick. So I'm going to actually pull up VS Code. And in VS Code over here, uh, I'm just make this terminal a little bit bigger. I have a terminal set up. Okay, I'm just going to make it bigger. Um, and in, in your terminal, both on Windows and on Mac and Linux, you should have a program called NS Lookup, short for Name Server Lookup. Okay. So I'm going to type that in. I'm going to type in my terminal ns lookup, and then I'm going to type um, the uh, domain that I'm trying to look up on this name server. So for example, in this case, uh, I'll ignore www. I'll just do google.com. All right. So check that out. Um, what is happening here is uh, it's, it's saying which server my uh, my uh, computer is using for its uh, DNS server. In this case, this is uh, an IP address for my uh, local host. But let's ignore this part for now. Um, it, this is saying, hey, uh, I think that Google.com is located at this IP address, 142.250.69.206. Now, you might get a different number. Uh, that is actually a part of the hint as to the previous question that I asked you uh, before. Um, and that's totally fine. That's, in fact, kind of expected. Um, let's take a look at what happens if I look uh, up NS lookup uh, google.ca. Uh, and we can see that that is a different IP address, right? So these are located on different servers somewhere in the world, which is pretty cool. I encourage you to try the TLD uh, for your for your locale, for example, like like BR or IN or UK, uh, UK I think it's CO UK, I'm not actually sure, uh, all of them, uh, but, but try them out um, and see what types of answers you get. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, and we're gonna come back to this uh, and we're gonna be able to see that we can actually look up um, IP addresses for IPv4 and v6 as well, which is pretty cool. So uh, hopefully you find that interesting. I highly encourage you to poke around in there to give that a test because uh, once you can see that these are just mappings between names and addresses, uh, a lot of things start to clear up pretty quickly. Okay, so I'm going to switch to uh, IP now. And that's the thing that we were uh, just looking at, right? So when we look up a domain, we get back an IP address. And this IP address, uh, in this case, is what's called an IPv4 address. But before we get into that, I just want to mention that IP stands for Internet Protocol. Uh, we're going to be looking into this in a little bit more depth uh, in the next uh, video. Uh, so I don't want to go too, uh, too ahead for there, uh, but just know that this gives us back an IP address. And this is what uh, the uh, network and computers and servers and switches and routers and all that kind of stuff uh, in the internet use to figure out where to route our data and then back again. So every single computer on the internet has an IP address, a unique IP address, and we can talk to each other through these addresses. Literally the same thing as having a house address, right? If you think of, if you were to order something uh, like let's say on the internet, right? And you go internet shopping and you buy something uh, off the internet, uh, you would normally have to put like a delivery address, right? And you have to put very specifically like a unit number if you're in an apartment and like a house number and then the street number and, and the street name and all that kind of stuff, right? And different 
uh, different countries do it slightly differently. Some places have like a postal code, a zip code. There's all these things that we've invented as humans to make it easier to deliver packages to each other, right? Uh, the internet works the same way. We are delivering packages to each other, in this case, clients and servers uh, and vice versa, and they need to know how to talk to each other and how to deliver packages to each other. Um, and those are called packets, uh, funnily enough, in, in computing speak. Um, so this is literally the same thing as a house address, uh, for the most part, for uh, everything on the internet, which is pretty cool if you think of that way. Um, now, there are really two types of IP addresses. There's IPv4, uh, which is a 32-bit address, uh, which means that it takes 32 bits of space, so 32 zeros and ones. Um, and there's IPv6, which is the uh, kind of extended version, because we actually ran out, or quote unquote, almost ran out of IPv4 32-bit addresses recently. And this has space for 128 bits, which is, I, I think, something silly like if, if every atom in the universe had like an IP address or something, like we would have enough IP addresses, something like that. Don't quote me on that, but something a bit ridiculous along those lines where we probably, you know, won't run out. We said that when we made IPv4, uh, we probably will find a way to run out uh, for IPv6. Maybe we'll have like tunneling into other dimensions and now we're going to need IP addresses for all of those atoms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, for now, I think that's going to be enough space. Um, what you can see is that IPv4s are pretty easy to recognize. They look like this. Uh, it's four uh, numbers separated by dots. Uh, and IPv6s uh, are a bit trickier to understand. And there's some shortcuts in there that you can do to cut stuff off uh, if there's like a lot of zeros and things like that. Um, so I'm not going to go too deep down this. Just know that if you see something that looks like this, it's probably an IPv6 address. If you see something that looks like this, it's probably an IPv4 address. Um, there are some pretty common ones. Like localhost, uh, for example, is just a domain name for uh, your local computer, um, which is uh, resolved to its own IP address, like 127001 or something like that. Um, your router might have like an IP address for your network, like 192.168.11 uh, or 01, things like that. So you can touch to different devices, even on your own local network. Um, and there's a lot of depth you can go into if you're interested in this topic. This is like the topic of networking. There's a lot of uh, different books that you can read about uh, specifically like this kind of stuff if you're interested. There's actually kind of cool, a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, it, uh, maybe eventually one day what we can do is we can actually start um, creating um, a very low level program that actually deals with some of this stuff uh, where we can actually make the individual headers in something like C, for example. So um, that's uh, kind of how the IP addresses work. And so let, let me kind of switch back to uh, VS Code here. Um, and I'll uh, clear out my console just so I have a bit more space. Um, and I'll run uh, my NS lookup really quick for google.com. Uh, but I'm going to just add this uh, parameter here. I'm going to say query equals A, capital A, just like that. Okay, so it's NS lookup space query equals capital A space google.com. Press enter. Um, it will eventually, uh, <laughs> I don't know why that's taking so long. Uh, that should resolve pretty quickly. Uh, is it something wrong there? Let me try one more time. Okay, that normally should work. Uh, I don't really know what's wrong with that one. I'm gonna try uh, what I wanted to show you, which was the quad record, which is A-A-A-A-A-A-A, all caps. Um, if I do that, uh, it also doesn't seem to work. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not really sure why that is. If that works for you, great. If it doesn't work, um, another way to use this program is just to go into the actual program itself. So I'm gonna type NS lookup like this, and I'm gonna actually enter the program. And what you'll see is I'll get a slightly different uh, terminal, uh, like a little carrot here that looks slightly different because now I'm inside this NS lookup program. Um, so for example, if I type google.com, I will get uh, this answer right here. Let me just clear my terminal here. and I'll type google.com. I'm inside the NS lookup tool. And you can see that I get um, google.com is at this address. Now I can do something like set uh, query equals uh, to a, 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 just like that. And now I'm setting that parameter in this program. And if I type google.com now, uh, what you'll see is I will also have the answer for the quad A record, which is the IPv6 record right here, which looks something like this, which is uh, pretty interesting. And, and similarly, I can do set uh, query equal just one A, and I can uh, run google.com, and you can see that I get the answer for the IPv4 address. So that's right there. And the quad A, which is the IPv6 is right there. Now. Um, 
you don't need to do any of this stuff, right? Like I'm just showing you this as a demo so you can see that this is real stuff that actually exists in our computers and in our networks, which is pretty cool. And it's nice to be able to know that there are tools that can translate back and forth between these types of the, uh, domains and addresses, uh, because eventually when you deploy our application, for example, our API to some kind of server somewhere, uh, maybe we're going to use uh, like uh, some kind of cloud service, like say Amazon or, or uh, Microsoft or Google or something, um, or any other private digital ocean, something like that, we could, um, we will have to know the domains and the IP addresses uh, at some point so that we can actually point things around to the right places. Okay. So uh, control K uh, or command K, I think to get out of that, uh, or is it alt, alt K? Uh, or I think it's actually, uh, sorry, control or command C, I think it is. There you go. Okay. I'm out of that. Oh my goodness. Um, so many different things to remember all the time. I always end up forgetting, uh, but hopefully that works for you. Uh, it's usually control or command C to get out of things or control or command D should work as well. Um, okay, so uh, let's switch back here. So that's the IP addresses and the internet pro protocol. We'll, we'll go into a bit more depth in the next video on how the internet protocol works because it's definitely uh, handy for some uh, debugging and just understanding general networking as well. Now, the final thing I wanna show in this video is something called the port, okay? Uh, so this is a network, uh, network port. And um, the idea for this, the, the fundamental premise for this is that we have these things called um, ports on the back of things like uh, routers and switches. You probably have seen them. Now, if you have one at home, I encourage you to take a look. These are physical ports, okay? Usually you plug in some kind of cable into these um, and you would be able to access uh, you know, that device or the devices that are connected to that device. Um, now our computers have uh, virtual ports, which means in software we have these defined virtual ports and they uh, range from zero to 65,535 which is 16 bits um, uh, long of data. Now, of course, you wouldn't be able to have 60,000 ports on a real machine, hence why we need virtual ports. And what ends up happening is we can have applications on a single computer, multiple applications, each listening on a different port so that each application uh, can kind of have its own stream of data to it specifically. Um, so each application can only use one port um, uh, or is assigned to one, or one port can only go to one application. Um, and for example, uh, on the same machine, we could do something like this. We could say our REST API version one is on this port, 12,000. We can have another uh, REST API. Maybe one is for authentication. Uh, maybe one is for like um, our actual data. Uh, that could be on another port, right? And we could, we could have as many as we want or as many as our computer has memory for, uh, which is pretty cool. There are reserved ports as well. Um, for example, uh, everything below 1024 is usually reserved. So things like uh, 21 uh, is, I think, file transfer protocol. 25 is usually like the, the mail one. Uh, I forget which one it is. Uh, 80 is usually for HTTP uh, non-encrypted traffic. And, and 443 is for um, encrypted traffic HTTPS, which we'll get into in the, in the next video together. So when you're uh, using ports, make sure not to use anything below 1024. And we'll see uh, exactly how this works when we get our program uh, that we're going to be setting up in Dino together, a port number to listen on for our first server that we end up building in a couple of videos from now. Um, so just keep this in mind. You definitely don't want to be using any of the reserve ports. So um, that said, I want to switch over to Google really quick. And I'm going to uh, type in here uh, reserved, reserved, oh my gosh, reserved ports. And um, you can see uh, a list, uh, probably on Wikipedia, a list of TCP UDB port numbers. Ignore those protocols for now. We're going to go through them in the next video. Uh, but if I zoom in a whole bunch here, if you scroll down, you'll see well-known ports. Um, you'll see uh, a whole a whole bunch of these, right? Zero, one, two, three, five. So I think, what did I say? 21 was file transfer protocol. There's that one. Uh, there was 25 was uh, SMTP. That's the one right there for mail. There's a whole bunch of these. Uh, you can see that 80 is one that we're gonna be using a lot for web, uh, which is unencrypted HTTP traffic. And then I think there's like, if you scroll down here, 443 is the one for HTTPS. I, I highly encourage you just to look through this and see if there's any that you recognize. Um, there's probably going to be a whole bunch you don't recognize. Like I have no idea what most of these are, but there are going to be a, a bunch that you do recognize. And it's important to know that you shouldn't be using these port numbers because many other uh, programs rely on these being um, uh, open for other uh, types of applications. Uh, so make sure to use a port number above uh, 1000. Uh, and that way you'll be pretty safe from actually not bumping into one of these. Okay. So uh, that is port numbers. Um, 
what I want to do is just wrap a couple things together and actually show you a demo in uh, Insomnia as well. So before we look at this, um, I just want you to think of this process from start to finish. So this is our URL that we had at the beginning. Okay, HTTPS, uh, www.google.com uh, slash search, and then we have a query parameter in this case. Okay, um, if, if we were to break this down to the steps that we just talked about, we would have step one, which is the DNS domain name system. We're going to say, where is google.com? Because we don't, we need a number. We need the, the set of numbers that represent the address for google.com. So the DNS server is going to say, Hey, that's over here. We get back an IPv4 address or an IPv6 address. Our computer is going to handle all that. And then we can do an HTTP request to, in this case, if we're doing an internet request, uh, over, uh, for a website or HTTP, we would be using port 80. For HTTPS, we would be using port uh, 443. And then we would make a final URL that looks something like this. Um, and we would be able to make a request to that URL to get that data, which is actually pretty cool. Um, okay, so that pretty much brings it together. I highly encourage you to make sure that this slide makes sense. Um, honestly, like if, if you can sit there and, and stare at this long enough for it to make sense and, and really ask yourself, each step of the way, does that make sense? And is that doing what I think it is? Um, that goes a huge long way to understanding uh, everything, almost everything in networking, like how computers talk to each other, how networking works, and even how all the APIs and servers that we're building together actually interface with each other. All right, so to wrap up the video, I wanna pull up uh, Insomnia. Um, if you don't have it uh, pulled up, go ahead and open that program and you'll have something that looks like this. So we had collections. Um, I have a playground collection where I test a bunch of stuff. Uh, I have a REST API in-depth collection in here, which I created in the last video together. So I'm just gonna go ahead in there. You can see that we made requests to this Pokemon API before. Um, so I wanna show you something really interesting. Um, I'm gonna make a new request over here. I'm gonna go to a plus button and click HTTP request. Um, I'm going to rename this one. Uh, let's just say uh, Google. And I'll, I'll rename that to Google. And what I want to do in here is I'm going to uh, do something kind of strange. Okay. I'm going to go back to my VS code and I'm going to say uh, NS lookup. Uh, let's see if this works this time. I don't know why it didn't work last time. Query equals capital A google.com. Oh, it doesn't work. If someone can tell me why that doesn't work, I would really like to know um, why that doesn't work. Uh, I got to go into it, but let's just get the uh, IP address right there. I'm just going to get rid of the query equals a part. So that's the IP address for google.com. Okay. Now, in theory, if you think about this for a second, in theory, if I save the computer a step and skip directly to the IP address, if I skip the domain system entirely and I just go straight to the IP address and I plug that in for the address in my, um, in my insomnia or even in my web browser, do you think it's going to work? Let's take a look. I'm going to copy this. And if you get a different value, uh, definitely copy that value. Uh, so I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go to insomnia. I'm going to just punch it in right here. Now this looks really strange, <laughs> right? That's a really, really odd. That was just a bunch of random numbers that we're doing a get request to. Uh, so let's see what happens. I'm going to click send and whoa, look at that. Um, that's Google. Now it looks kind of weird because we have like all these, like the, the styling is kind of a bit off and everything looks kind of pretty old school because there's no um, JavaScript and there's no uh, CSS really uh, beyond the, the basics, what's in there already in line. Uh, but that actually worked, right? We actually were able to get google.com from its IP address, which is kind of crazy. Um, let, let's try something else. I'm going to say HTTP colon slash slash, and I'm going to, at the very end of this URL, I'm going to put port 80, just like that. Okay. A uh, colon and then 80. So I'm saying use HTTP and then go to port 80 for this IP address and click send again. And look at that. It still works which is kind of crazy, right? I think that's pretty crazy. Um, I'm going to go to this timeline tab right here, which is uh, the last tab, uh, preview headers, cookies, and timeline. Um, and this is going to give us a, a bit of a rundown as to exactly what happens. I highly encourage you to play around with this because it really helps understanding how networking actually works. You can see that we're making a request to this URL. Uh, you can see that we're using default HTTP. We have something called SSL validation, whatever that means, we'll see in the next video. It, it says we have a bundle. We cannot multiplex even if we wanted to, exclamation, that's pretty cute. Um, and then you can see that we connected to this IP address on port 80. And you can see that there's some interesting stuff in here, a get HTTP 1.1, here's the host, here's the user agent. So these are something called the request headers. 
Down here are the actual response headers, which we'll look at in the next set of videos. Uh, but you can see that um, if, if we, uh, where is it? If we scroll down to the bottom, we're getting back some data over here. And if we go to the uh, headers, which we'll look at in future videos, there's a bunch of cool information in there that gives us some data. And then eventually the preview uh, and the actual uh, source code or the raw data that comes back, you can take a look at those instead of just the visual preview, but we get back the actual Google URL, which is pretty cool. So there you have it. Uh, that's pretty cool. I, I really encourage you to play around with this, uh, honestly. Like uh, the amount that you can learn by just poking around and breaking things and trying different things, like try HTTPS, try different port numbers, see what you can uh, kind of come up with when you're uh, when, when you're poking around in here and, and take a look at the timeline, all that kind of stuff. You will learn so much so quickly, um, even just uh, with just basic URL structure and networking. It, it's, it's pretty awesome, uh, the amount of fun that you can have. At least I think it's fun. Uh, and I encourage you to give that a shot because that gets you much more comfortable with how these URLs work and some of the issues you might run into if you start having uh, errors with uh, the format of the URL uh, or other things that are pretty more advanced when we actually get to using these uh, in our REST API and actually structuring them ourselves. Um, so there you have it. And that's kind of everything put together. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, I know it's a non-traditional and you expected a bunch of coding, which I promise you we'll get to uh, shortly together. Uh, there are a couple other topics I do want to go through, uh, which are uh, protocols, uh, which I mentioned a few times already, just so we can understand things like HTTPS and HTTP and TLS and some of the other uh, things uh, like IP and all the headers, as well as just those header uh, response requests uh, headers as well, because we're going to be using that so much throughout the course. And that gives us the fundamentals to actually finally start coding in Dino with our web server and actually trying different types of content back like JSON and file content, for example, um, or even HTML content if we want and eventually work up towards building our API uh, for the REST standard. Um, so if you liked this video, I'd love it if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Um, I'd love to hear in the comments kind of what you thought of this. Was it useful to you? Have you seen these concepts before? Um, if you do want to support the channel, I have a Patreon set up. You can check it out there and support, uh, or you can uh, check out uh, YouTube memberships or uh, buy super thanks. Uh, I would really appreciate any of those. Um, but in the next video, as I mentioned, we're going to go through uh, the protocols uh, in depth, followed by the actual request and response headers. Uh, so exercise wise, uh, uh, I'll encourage you to try poking around in Insomnia and even uh, in Chrome, for example, try uh, punching in those uh, IP addresses for a bit more practice. Um, and then I'll see you in the next video where we took at, take a look at protocols together. See you later.